Chapter 5 of The Way of Peace This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Sunny Abdullah Chapter 5 Entering into the Infinite From the beginning of time, man, in spite of his bodily appetites and desires, in the midst of all his clinging to earthly and impermanent things, has ever been intuitively conscious of the limited, transient, and illusionary nature of his material existence, and in his sane and silent moments has tried to reach out into a comprehension of the infinite, and has turned with tearful aspiration toward the restful reality of the eternal heart. While vainly imagining that the pleasures of earth are real and satisfying, pain and sorrow continually remind him of their unreal and unsatisfying nature. Ever striving to believe that complete satisfaction is to be found in material things, he is conscious of an inward and persistent revolt against this belief, which revolt is at once a refusion of his essential mortality, and an inherent and imperishable proof that only in the immortal, the eternal, the infinite, can he find abiding satisfaction and unbroken peace. And here is the common ground of faith, here is the root and spring of all religion, here the soul of brotherhood and the heart of love, that man is essentially and spiritually divine and eternal, and that, immersed in mortality and troubled with unrest, he is ever striving to enter into a consciousness of his real nature. The spirit of man is inseparable from the infinite and can be satisfied with nothing short of the infinite, and the burden of pain will continue to weigh upon a man's heart, and the shadows of sorrow to darken his pathway, until, ceasing from his wanderings in the dream world of matter, he comes back to his home in the reality of the eternal. As the smallest drop of water detached from the ocean contains all the qualities of the ocean, so a man, detached in consciousness from the infinite, contains within him its likeness, and as the drop of water must, by the law of its nature, ultimately find its way back to the ocean and lose itself in its silent depths. So must man, by the unfailing law of his nature, at last return to his source, and lose himself in the great ocean of the infinite. To become one with the infinite is the goal of man, to enter into perfect harmony with the eternal law is wisdom, love, and peace. But this divine state is, and must ever be, incomprehensible to the merely personal. Personality, separateness, selfishness are one and the same, and are the antithesis of wisdom and divinity. By the unqualified surrender of the personality, separateness and selfishness cease and man enters into the possession of his divine heritage of immortality and infinity. Such surrender of the personality is regarded by the worldly and selfish mind as the most grievous of all calamities, the most irreparable loss, yet it is the one supreme and incomparable blessing, the only real and lasting gain. The mind unenlightened upon the inner laws of being and upon the nature and destiny of its own life, clings to transient appearances, things which have in them no enduring substantiality, and so clinging, perishes, for the time being, amid the shattered wreckage of his own illusions. Men cling to and gratify the flesh as though it were going to last forever, and though they try to forget the nearness and inevitability of its dissolution, the dread of death and the loss of all that they cling to clouds their happiest hours, and the chilling shadow of their own selfishness follows them like a remorseless spectre. And with the accumulation of temporal comforts and luxuries, the divinity within men is drugged, and they sink deeper and deeper into materiality, into the perishable life of the senses, and where there is sufficient intellect, Theories concerning the immortality of the flesh come to be regarded as infallible truths. When a man's soul is clouded with selfishness in any or every form, 
he loses the power of spiritual discrimination, and confuses the temporal with the eternal, the perishable with the permanent, mortality with immortality, and error with truth. It is thus that the world has come to be filled with theories and speculations, having no foundation in human experience. Every body of flesh contains within itself, from the hour of birth, the elements of its own destruction, and by the unalterable law of its own nature must it pass away. The perishable in the universe can never become permanent. The permanent can never pass away. The mortal can never become immortal. The immortal can never die. The temporal cannot become eternal, nor the eternal become temporal. Appearance can never become reality, nor reality fade into appearance. Error can never become truth, nor can truth become error. Man cannot immortalize the flesh, but, by overcoming the flesh, by relinquishing all its inclinations, he can enter into the region of immortality. God alone hath immortality, and only by realizing the God state of consciousness does man enter into immortality. All nature in its myriad forms of life is changeable, impermanent, unenduring. Only the informing principle of nature endures. Nature is many, and is marked by separation. The informing principle is one, and is marked by unity. By overcoming the senses and the selfishness within, which is the overcoming of nature, man emerges from the chrysalis of the personal and illusory, and wings himself into the glorious light of the impersonal, the region of universal truth, out of which all perishable forms come. Let men, therefore, practice self-denial, let them conquer their animal inclinations, let them refuse to be enslaved by luxury and pleasure. Let them practice virtue, and grow daily into higher and even higher virtue, until at last they grow into the divine, and enter into both the practice and comprehension of humility, meekness, forgiveness, compassion and love, which practice and comprehension constitute divinity. Good will gives insight. And only he who has so conquered his personality that he has but one attitude of mind, that of good will, toward all creatures, is possessed of divine insight, and is capable of distinguishing the true from the false. The supremely good man is, therefore, the wise man, the divine man, the enlightened seer, the knower of the eternal where you find unbroken gentleness, enduring patience, sublime lowliness, graciousness of speech, self-control, self-forgetfulness, and deep and abounding sympathy, look there for the highest wisdom. Seek the company of such a one, for he has realized the divine, he lives with the eternal, he has become one with the infinite. Believe not him that is impatient, given to anger, boastful, who clings to pleasure and refuses to announce his selfish gratifications, and who practices not good will and far-reaching compassion, for such a one hath not wisdom, vain is all his knowledge, and his works and words will perish, for they are grounded on that which passes away. Let a man abandon self, let him overcome the world, let him deny the personal, by this pathway only can he enter into the heart of the infinite. The world, the body, the personality are mirages upon the desert of time, transitory dreams in the dark night of spiritual slumber. And those who have crossed the desert, those who are spiritually awakened, have alone comprehended the universal reality, where all appearances are dispersed and dreaming and delusion are destroyed. There is one great law which exacts unconditional obedience, one unifying principle which is the basis of all diversity, one eternal truth wherein all the problems of earth pass away like shadows. To realize this law, this unity, this truth, 
is to enter into the infinite, is to become one with the eternal. To center one's life in the great law of love is to enter into rest, harmony, peace, to refrain from all participation in evil and discord, to cease from all resistance to evil and from the omission of that which is good, and to fall back upon unswerving obedience to the holy calm within, is to enter into the inmost heart of things, is to attain to a living, conscious experience of that eternal and infinite principle which must ever remain a hidden mystery to the merely perspective intellect. Until this principle is realized, the soul is not established in peace. He who so realizes is truly wise, not wise with the wisdom of the learned, but with the simplicity of a blameless heart and of a divine manhood. To enter into a realization of the infinite and eternal is to rise superior to time and the world and the body which compromise the kingdom of darkness and is to become established in immortality, heaven, and the spirit, which make up the empire of light. Entering into the infinite is not a mere theory or sentiment. It is a vital experience which is the result of assiduous practice in inward purification. When the body is no longer believed to be, even remotely, the real man, when all appetites and desires are thoroughly subdued and purified, then the emotions are rested and calm. And when the oscillation of the intellect ceases and perfect poise is secured, then, and not until then, does consciousness become one with the infinite. Not until then is childlike wisdom and profound peace secured. Men grow weary and grey of the dark problems of life and finally pass away and leave them unsolved because they cannot see their way out of the darkness of the personality, being too much engrossed in its limitations. Seeking to save his personal life, man forfeits the greater impersonal life in truth. Clinging to the perishable, he is shut out from a knowledge of the eternal. By the surrender of self, all difficulties are overcome, and there is no error in the universe, but the fire of inward sacrifice will burn it up like a shaft. No problem, however great, but will disappear like a shadow under the searching light of self-abnegation. Problems exist only in our own self-created illusions, and they vanish away when self is yielded up. Self and error are synonymous. Error is involved in the darkness of unfathomable complexity, but eternal simplicity is the glory of truth. Love of self shuts men out from truth. By seeking their own personal happiness, they lose the deeper, purer, and more abiding bliss, says Carlyle. There is in man a higher than love of happiness. He can do without happiness, and instead thereof find blessedness. Love not pleasure, love God. This is the eternal yea, wherein all contradiction is solved, wherein whoso walks and works, it is well with him. He who has yielded up that self, that personality that men most love, and to which they cling with such fierce tenacity, has left behind him all perplexity, and has entered into a simplicity so profoundly simple as to be looked upon by the world, involved as it is in a network of error, as foolishness. Yet such a one has realized the highest wisdom, and is at rest in the infinite. He accomplishes without striving, and all problems melt before him, for he has entered the region of reality, that deals, not with changing effects, but with the unchanging principle of things, he is enlightened with a wisdom which is superior to ratiocination, as reason is to animality. Having yielded up his lusts, his errors, his opinions and prejudices, he has entered into a possession of the knowledge of God, having slain the selfish desire for heaven, and along with it the ignorant fear of hell. Having relinquished even the love of life itself, 
he has gained supreme bliss and life eternal, the life which bridges life and death and knows its own immortality. Having yielded up all without reservation, he has gained all, and rests in peace on the bosom of the infinite. Only he who has become so free from self as to be equally content to be annihilated as to live, or to live as to be annihilated, is fit to enter into the infinite. Only he who, ceasing to trust his perishable self, has learned to trust in the boundless measure of the great law, the supreme good, is prepared to partake of undying bliss. For such a one there is no more regret, nor disappointment, nor remorse. For where all selfishness has ceased, these sufferings cannot be, and whatever happens to him, he knows that it is for his own good, and he is content, being no longer the servant of self, but the servant of the Supreme. He is no longer affected by the changes of earth, and when he hears of wars and rumours of wars, his peace is not disturbed, and where men grow angry and cynical and quarrelsome, he bestows compassion and love. Though appearances may contradict it, he knows that the world is progressing, and that, through its laughing and its weeping, through its living and its keeping, through its follies and its labours, weaving in and out of sight, to the end from the beginning, through all virtue and all sinning, reeled from God's great spool of progress, runs the golden thread of light. When a fierce storm is raging, none are angered about it, because they know it will quickly pass away. And when the storms of contention are devastating the world, the wise man, looking with the eye of truth and pity, knows that it will pass away, and that out of the wreckage of broken hearts which it leaves behind, the immortal temple of wisdom will be built. Sublimely patient, infinitely compassionate, deep, silent, and pure, his very presence is a benediction. And when he speaks, men ponder his words in their hearts, and by them rise to higher levels of attainment. Such is he who has entered into the infinite, who, by the power of utmost sacrifice, has solved the sacred mystery of life. Questioning life and destiny and truth, I sought the dark and labyrinthine sphinx, who spake to me this strange and wondrous thing. Concealment only lies in blinded eyes, and God alone can see the form of God. I sought to solve this hidden mystery vainly by paths of blindness and of pain, but when I found the way of love and peace, concealment ceased, and I was blind no more. Then saw I God, e, with the eyes of God. End of chapter 5 Recording by Sunny Abdullah